it's about that time. We need to have a serious discussion about Yakuza's general misogyny, the Yuga Gotoku Zero's particularly aggressive hatred towards women, and the example the Yuga Gotoku is setting for the men these games are made for. Don't click away if you're rolling your eyes. Hear me out for a second, just one second. This isn't going to bash the developers or be a petition to boycott the Yakuza series. I highly respect the folks who work on Ryuga Gotoku, and I'm probably never going to stop playing it. I know I can be pretty vocal about my convictions, but the Ryuga Gotoku series is about holding strong to your convictions and exercising them in healthy ways. This is one of those ways. This isn't going to be the conversation you might be thinking it is. At the time I'm writing this, I still haven't played anything past Yakuza 0 in order of release, so Yakuza 0 will be my main focus here, which is fine because it's arguably the worst offender and the best example of what I'm talking about. Also, full disclosure, some of this is lifted straight from the Yakuza 0 video, so if you hear something familiar, you're not losing your mind, I'm just recycling. But Yuga Gotoku has an issue with its depiction of women. In my Yakuza 2 video, I talk about how Kaoru Sayama's cunning and strong-willed personality is suddenly stripped from her at the last minute to turn her into a distraught damsel way in over her head. Yakuza 2 introduces her as one of the few women on the Japanese police force, strong of character and resilient against the discrimination she faces from her peers. As the story continues, however, Sayama's confidence slowly unravels. At one point, the kind of two-bit thug she should be able to handle with ease slaps her across the face, and suddenly she's shocked, scared, immobilized. From this point on, Sayama slowly loses any semblance of the character she was introduced as. By the end of the game, she is afraid, unsure, and in need of guidance. The reason for this sudden transformation? She falls in love with our male protagonist. This woman beats up Yakuza on a daily basis, and suddenly she's confused by Yakuza protocol and helplessly pleading with our main characters to stop fighting. Plainly, Kaoru Sayama is written to be a woman who acts tough, but secretly is a wilting flower who relinquishes her power to a man the moment she falls in love with him. While Sayama is not the first person in the series to be motivated by romance, her portrayal in Ryuga Gotoku 2 was the first time I noticed how aggressively the series needs to make women seem incapable. It wants to do this so badly, they wrote Sayama out of the series entirely at the start of Yakuza 3. Rather than keep her around as a strong woman character who could rival the regular cast, Ryuga Gotoku Studios elected to erase her from the world altogether. Since her removal, strong women in Ryuga Gotoku are shamed for being so. In Ryuga Gotoku, strong women are commonly antagonists, deceitful, tricksters, liars, or aid the villains in some way before suffering tragic consequences. Mirai Park in Yakuza 5 is a no-nonsense businesswoman with defiant resolve and cunning. She's wise enough to convince Kiryu to let Haruka go with her to be an idol, she's cutthroat in her contract negotiations, and unwavering in the face of aggression. Not a tough as nails fighter like Sayama, but equally powerful in her own right. In return, the world of Ryuga Gotoku spites Mirai Park at every opportunity it gets. It paints Park as this deeply flawed woman who shouldn't be celebrated. In one scene, evil music plays as she describes her life, with a musical sting highlighting her mentioning having gotten an abortion. When she reveals her fiancé at the time slapped her across the face for it, she does so in a forgiving manner, saying she probably deserved it. In the following cutscene, she's killed off screen. In 15 consecutive minutes, Mirai Park is shamed for having chosen her career over starting a family, is used to excuse spousal abuse, and the short cutscene we have of her being motherly to Haruka would have been a wholesome moment had it not been used to Loki suggest she had made the wrong decision for her future. She's then hastily removed from the story after she has served her purpose, shaming women for body autonomy. Other times, women lack agency in their own plots. No matter how hard she tries in Yakuza 5, Haruka Sawamura, daughter of Kazuma Kiryu, survivor of countless kidnappings and dangerous situations, is completely helpless. She's impossibly innocent and pure. One can argue this is the point of Haruka as a character. She represents Kiryu's own innocence and hope, 
But Yakuza 5 takes this idea to a ludicrous degree by refusing to allow Sawamura to stand up for herself during conflict and bow down to any and all versions of authority attempting to subdue her. She never stands up for herself against the rival idol group, T-Set. She never attempts to fool the Yakuza who keep trying to kidnap her, and when she's swept away off to the world of idol culture, her reasons for wanting to do so are unclear. In fact, Ryuga Gozuku 2 has a very important cutscene which sums up her entire character arc in Yakuza 5 in about two minutes. At no point do we ever hear Sawamura voice her desires to be an idol. In fact, what we actually get from Yakuza 5 about her idol dreams is essentially, well, well I mean, every little girl wants to be an idol. Without clear justification and poor buildup in previous entries, it's apparent Haruka Sawamura's story in Yakuza 5 was less of a fun digression from Yakuza's typical game loop and more of a subtle way of describing young women. Young women need to be subservient. Young women need to do as they're told. They need to be nice and pure and forgiving. Ryuga Gotoku 5 didn't allow me the satisfaction of breaking a man's arm as Haruka Sawamura, but on a more serious note, it told me, a man, that women are frail, prim, and proper, and the ones who aren't are women I can disrespect. There's obviously nothing wrong with a woman character being soft or timid, but Sawamura is another woman in a pattern of women being used to reinforce a rigid expectation. A lot of these examples, intentional or not, are demeaning to women, but we can rationalize how they happen. Sometimes, when a story is losing its momentum, you want to introduce a little drama, a little twist to get it moving again. You want something impactful, you want someone Kiryu cares about, threatened, or kidnapped, or pressured into doing something which spurs him into action. A beloved sibling or love interest is the perfect victim for an effective shock development. Because the series utilizes both men and women for this, I don't want to paint this as inherently malicious. Just when the character happens to be a woman, they're on a higher priority list to be made into tragedies, even when it makes more sense for men in the narrative to be in danger instead. This is why I like Yakuza 3 a whole lot. It put men in fragile positions and didn't shy away from making them vulnerable and insecure. Stay with me here because this isn't the problem either. I mean, it's definitely a problem, but anyone can give it the soft and short-sighted pass of it's a man writing a story for men, lacking experience in writing women characters, or unintentionally using internalized misconceptions of women when writing. After all, Ryuga Gotoku is made for men, specifically Japanese men, and has been since the day Nagoshi conceived the idea for the series. And this is fine. Games can be made for men. Uh, we don't have to explicitly say it. A general fact we can acknowledge is most games probably are made for men or boys and are built with the intention of selling to a male audience. Should a majority of games maybe not do this in general? Yes. Can Ryuga Gotoku be a game specifically and overtly for adult men intended to be played by men? Also yes. But should it also be mindful of what it says about women? Absolutely yes. Games made for men don't have to put down anyone who isn't a man. Making others out to be less than men has nothing to do with masculinity. We don't have to make others uncomfortable for us to be validated as men, and we shouldn't excuse poor writing throwing another large part of Yakuza's audience, women, non-binary folks, under the bus to validate us. When Ryuga Gotoku Zero, set in the 80s in one of the filthiest red light districts of its time, aims for authenticity by including stories about sex clubs and sex workers and has instances of women being accosted in the streets. When it has softcore pornography you can collect, albeit to ultimately subvert your expectation and make you feel like a loser for watching it. When it includes telephone club light gun shooter minigames and teases you with sexy images or uses sex as comedy, like when training a dominatrix in the middle of broad daylight on how to be more of a sadist. I don't bat an eye. I don't bat an eye because this is an authentic representation of this place during this time period. It was awful towards women, dominated by sexual pretense and raunchy, kinky ideas, and it shouldn't shy away from representing it accurately. Otherwise, I'm pretty cool on Ryuga Gotoku's lewd content because anything you do with a woman is framed in consent and is so clearly in the realm of bizarre sexual contexts that I'm not trying to qualify it as anything else. The underground catfighting ring in Yakuza 0 is incredibly pervy and full of problematic elements, but have you seen it? 
This English teacher is doing German suplexes and dislocating arms from shoulder sockets. I want more equal representation in the games industry. I want more games pandering to women in the same way games pander to men right now. I'm not looking for that change in Ryuga Gotoku, but I am asking RGG Studios to consider what they're telling men about women in their games. To the series' credit, Yakuza has always been supportive of sex work and hostess clubs, and has done a serviceable job highlighting the injustices these women face without going so far as putting them into those situations gratuitously or belittling them. Hostess clubs have always been transparent about the business, learning about the kinds of customers hostesses get, the way the service operates, the policies in place, boundaries drawn, the backgrounds of these women and why they're hostessing, etc. Ryuga Gotaku Studios hires adult actresses to portray some of those hostesses and gives adult entertainers work outside of the adult industry. It uses their likeness to bring in the horny crowd, sure, but they're written as normal people, living their life, sharing their interests, sharing in the gonzo nature of the Ryuga Gotoku world. There's an air of respect for the women in both of these professions, a genuine admiration and acknowledgement of them being valid careers and often ostracized unfairly. Granted, dressing up the hostesses the way you want in Zero's management side quest, the way these women throw themselves at the playable characters in every game, and Yakuza framing these activities in the male gaze ultimately still is the objectification of women, but the self-awareness of how detrimental the male gaze is, and the constant reminder to the player what they're interacting with is a fantasy with lines they shouldn't cross, makes this aspect of Ryuga Gotoku a good lesson for men who dehumanize these women for being in these professions. Koji Yoshida, director, assistant screenwriter, and lead planner, probably provides this grounded approach. In the book commemorating Ryuga Gotoku's 10-year anniversary, he says, in order to bring a bit of reality to the mix, I use casual private conversations with acquaintances who actually work at hostess clubs as reference. If I didn't, they would just end up being convenient characters portrayed from the male standpoint. He acknowledges how this breaks the fantasy for some. It's often the case the most realistic characters are the ones who get the poorest reception from the players. Yoshida actively and openly avoids the male perspective when attempting to portray the women in these sub-stories, and although some players might not like this, it ultimately is what makes going to hostess clubs in Yakuza games worth it. So, sub-stories at times, yes, putting women in sketchy situations to talk about how men treat them is something I appreciate. In almost every case, the player, who is assumed to be a man, is preventing horrid acts against women by completely obliterating evil men. It's directly telling them not to behave like the men they are fighting against in these stories, and encouraging stepping in and shutting down bad situations before they can happen. And for a game to do all of these things with the expectation a man is going to play it, I'm all for it. Show them the women they objectify when they watch porn are real people who deserve respect. Shatter the fantasy and reinforce positive masculinity, and still let them indulge in their silly little ping pong booby game. Yakuza breaking the mold and portraying sex workers as human beings is huge when most fiction, in general, shames or reduces them into jokes or symbols of corruption. It's proof Ryuga Gotoku Studios is capable of writing women in a thoughtful way. Yet outside of the sex workers and hostesses, they're not. We've identified a troubling dichotomy here. While it's great sex workers and hostesses are getting some long overdue humanization, the stark contrast in the way Yakuza portrays them compared to other women in the game creates this incredibly misogynistic implication of the writer's attitudes. The only women worth writing better are the ones meant to satisfy my sexual desires. When claims of sexism and misogyny are made, Ryuga Gotoku is usually defended by citing its portrayal of men and how it addresses toxic masculinity. These citations aren't inaccurate. Yakuza constantly explores the relationship men have with each other, themselves, and society at large. Conflicts in Yakuza are directly related to men being unable to emotionally connect with others. In Yakuza 1, Nishikiyama becomes disconnected from Kiryu for 10 years and loses himself in the cold world of the criminal underground. His final act is to save the only person who ever truly knew him. In Yakuza 2, Kiryu's inner conflict throughout is related to his grief and struggle to reconnect with the people in his life. 
Together with Sayama, Kiryu learns to open his heart to others again, and Ryuji Goda, two central antagonists, exists to remind Kiryu men are more than the roles they carry. Ryuga Gotoku 3 is an incredible discussion on the intimacy between men, how men can love one another, be open with each other, care about each other, and be stronger for it. Kiryu and Rikia's intimate relationship, not a sexual one, or a romantic one. I see you there, dude who missed the point of what I was saying is the focus of Yakuza 3, a relationship where the two speak freely to each other about how they feel, about their desire to protect each other, of their admiration for one another. The villains of 3, inversely, are men who care little about their peers, exercise power to satisfy indulgences and take from others, with the final boss being Mine, a man who loses his father at a young age, struggles with his emotions, and lashes out in his frustration. Yakuza 4's connection to brotherhood, the commitment to male bonds, and the consequences of forsaking those bonds. Yakuza 5's handling of accountability, men ensuring other men face consequences for their transgressions, men establishing boundaries with and protecting other men. Even Yakuza 0 takes the time during its commentary on capitalism to show the deep bonds between Kiryu and Nishiki, the guilt haunting Majima because he was unable to help his sworn brother, and the ease with which the lieutenants of the Dojima family turn on one another once the opportunity is presented. Conflict in Yakuza is bred from a lack of compassion. Resolution is found in caring about the well-being of others. And every single one of these themes and stories can still exist in Ryuga Gotoku without also having to put women down or instill problematic behaviors in the men who play your game. The quality of a man in Ryuga Gotoku is measured by the extent of his kindness and respect. Yet, once someone other than a man becomes involved, Ryuga Gotoku suddenly doesn't seem to care about such measurements. Ryuga Gotoku Zero, the worst offender in the series so far, uses its setting as an excuse to be spiteful. Every woman is portrayed by one of three attributes, a lack of intelligence, a lack of compassion, or an extreme case of naivety. Substories about precarious situations Ryuga Gotoku typically addresses overall well and with our characters blaming the victims for ending up in the situation they find themselves in. Even in situations when a woman is not in danger or the opportunity to be even unintentionally misogynistic isn't presenting itself, women are often berated for saying anything or in other cases flat out treated like garbage, often such treatment being the focal point of the story. Here's a substory where a woman lacks the common sense to finish a simple crossword puzzle and is yelled at by the man trying to cleverly propose to her. Here's a restaurant intern being berated by her head chef for being incompetent and even when she's proven herself, gets no apology and suffers more ridicule. Here's a teenage girl selling used panties as a side hustle, which is already really skeevy because a minor is being involved, getting assaulted by a stalker and then being blamed for her stalker's actions. There is an entire string of sub-stories where the punchline is some women are not conventionally attractive, or are heavyset, or are not in their 20s? Then there's the sub-story where a foreign woman who is implied to have been sexually assaulted, extorted, and trafficked by a man holding her passport and visa hostage marries said man after he confesses his love to her, and this is framed as a wacky and fun hijinks ending. Even the main scenario kills a random faceless woman for no reason other than to intimidate another character and attempts to redeem a human trafficker knowing their actions have directly caused an incredible amount of harm to the story's only woman character. It then follows through by making said woman lose control following the death of another character and put herself into a situation no other human being would have reasonably done, even under emotional duress. All of this to give one of our main characters strong enough motivation to undergo a drastic change, a condition easily achieved without assassinating a character the narrative had done such a great job building from the get-go. And by character assassination, I'm not talking about a literal death. I'm talking about a character suddenly doing something completely out of character for the sake of the narrative, even if it makes no sense for her to be doing it. This scurries well past the shadow of the benefit of the doubt anyone can cast and makes Ryuga Gotoku Zero overwhelmingly insulting. It highlights an issue the series has had for a long time by being unapologetic about it. And it's unfortunate a series which does discuss toxic male stereotypes as successfully as it tends to do 
still finds the time to be this misogynistic. Yakuza is also famously transphobic, and Zero is no exception. The Pleasure King character, whether designed to be a drag queen or trans woman, it's a little ambiguous so it's honestly hard to tell, is constantly misgendered, at least by the localization, and is modeled and characterized in an unflattering way in line with many transphobic depictions of trans women. The Pleasure King is implied to be a predator, abusive to the women who work for her, and is not the first example of transphobia in the series. Yakuza 3 has a chain of sub-stories about a woman who continuously chases Kiryu around town attempting to sexually assault him. The Mama of Earth Angel, a bar in Kamado Cho's Champion District, shares the same physiological depictions of the aforementioned characters and has been in the series since its beginning. At no point have they ever gone back and redesigned her as a gesture of good faith. It's worth noting the Pleasure King is a boss fight in Yakuza 0, and if we compound this with Nagoshi's hard stance on not allowing players to fight women in Ryuga Gotoku, we can make an assumption on how this character was potentially viewed internally during development. And I thought, I thought I would find a lot of relevant information about this. From the fandom, the outlets, reviews, anything. Yakuza 0 is the game which brought the series back to the West. Yakuza 0 has a vast, colorful fanbase full of people from all walks of life. I don't think I'm particularly scholarly or academically inclined, so I don't want to sound pompous when I say, I do a good amount of research for Questrospective. And by a good amount, I mean I spend an entire day using the Wayback Machine and Google Translate to scour the internet for relevant articles, news updates, videos, blog posts, anything I can bookmark remotely talking about the Yakuza entry I'm writing for. Then I spend about two to three days, six hours each day, reading through and taking notes on each of those bookmarks, writing down quotes which stand out to me, and deleting bookmarks which turn out to be news sites plagiarizing each other or copy-pasting the same press release anyone who's part of a mailing list gets. For Yakuza 0, I read through every interview from the Ryuga Gotoku series 10th anniversary memorial book. Interviews with the motion cap actors, the sound engineers, the composer, a few of the directors, with lead writer and producer Yokoyama, with Nagoshi. I watched E3 panels and live previews where Nagoshi talked about telephone clubs and said, Yeah, you shouldn't do this though if you have a girlfriend there which was honestly really funny. I read interviews with the localization producers, Scott Strickhardt and Sam Mullen, talking about their methodology for localizing Ryuga Gotoku. I watched Ryuga Gotoku Zero promotional videos and dev diaries entirely in Japanese where I didn't find much, because I don't know how to speak or read Japanese. But I did recognize one lead writer slash producer who, with the help of a friend who did know Japanese, potentially revealed his cards in a video showcasing some of those troubling sub-stories I mentioned earlier. The term busu, for those of you who don't know, is a nasty derogatory term. It's an insult relating to a woman's appearance. It's not the sort of thing you say to someone without intending to offend them. I read reviews of Yakuza 0 hoping to find any mention of its treatment of women. Out of the major sites who covered the game, Polygon was the only outlet which did so in any substantial way. Coincidentally, this was also the only review I found written by a woman. No other piece of information about this game during the time of its launch, not even my own Twitter feed, usually filled with bakamitai and don don memes, had this conversation going on. So I expect there's people who are going to insist these issues don't matter to Ryuga Gotoku. People who will say things like the better treatment of women is a Western issue, and what's occurring here is a cultural miscommunication. But this is almost entirely juvenile to assume. For one, these conversations are being had all around the world. The Western Hemisphere may have its exclusive issues, but women exist everywhere, and Japanese women have been fighting against inequality for at least a hundred years now. They battle for harsher laws against domestic abuse, sexual assault, stalking, and sex trafficking, all of which lack substantial legislation in Japan. Gender inequality continues to be a huge issue there. Women are sometimes shunned for coming back to work after having children or never giving birth at all, and they're often blamed for their cases of abuse. The kind of predation women face is so bad, there are women-only train cars in Japan just to prevent groping. Recently, there's Ku2, a movement against the mandatory high-heel policies for women present in most Japanese businesses. 
Like women in so many other countries, Japanese women have to deal with sexism and misogyny on a near daily basis, and the root of the problem lies in the way they are perceived by society. And when Yakuza continues to validate this poor perception of women, when it tells men women who value their careers over having children are evil, when it tells them a woman should only be respected so long as there's a chance you can have sex with them, when it says if they aren't sweet and nice to you they're no good, don't you think you should call them out on it? So it's incredibly important, even in Japan, to push against depictions of women like this. It's incredibly important to expect better from the talented creators shaping the thoughts and minds of those ingesting their work. For another, Yakuza 0 is currently a 6 year old game and Ryuga Gotoku Studios has already done a lot to correct its past mistakes in these regards. In fact, it's possible Yakuza 0 was the turning point for the studio's handling of these kinds of characters. There's acknowledgement of their poor choices in projects developed after Zero. The Yakuza Remastered collection went to great lengths to correct terminology used, removed substory content entirely instead of trying to band-aid over its core premise, and rewrote other substories to be more accepting and inclusive of trans women. I'm told there are baby steps made in Yakuza 7 to address the way women have been treated in the series, and while baby steps are largely insignificant, I am prepared to cheer them on until the baby learns to run. I haven't watched it yet, because it contains Yakuza 7 spoilers, but I'm told Eurothug4000, or Maria for short, has a great segment in her video about Yakuza 7 discussing the series' treatment of women. Go check it out when you're done watching this, I'll have a link to it in the end card of this video. Critics suggest bringing more women onto the production, working closely with women on sections of the games involving women, consulting an established writer who is a woman on women characters who are going to be included in your narrative and what roles they're going to serve. I think these are good ideas capable of improving the way women are perceived in Yakuza. I think it's important for the series to show men how to respect women without pitying or thinking they're better than them at the same time. I think this is a way of solving many of the issues present in Ryuga Gotoku without making a woman a central protagonist or a perspective from which the story is being told. Even though the series has already done this, but everyone likes to pretend we didn't have fun doing magical girl idol transformations, you f***ing cowards. I understand the apprehension in having a woman lead for Ryuga Gotoku, because at its core, Ryuga Gotoku is about exploring masculinity and men interacting with men. I understand this is what it wants to discuss, even if I believe it can be done with a woman lead. What I don't understand is why it continues to be little women and completely disregard the conversation of masculinity when it comes to women. Yakuza seems to only care about being a good man to other men and falls short when it's asked to be a good man to anyone else, as though men are the only people worthy of respect. I find this perspective the mark of a weak and ugly man. This is an important detail because I can already hear someone yelling at me about it, about Ryuga Gotoku being made for men, and I have to insist, they're correct. They're absolutely correct. When Nagoshi was discussing the reset he wanted Ryuga Gotoku Zero to be, he spoke briefly about the player base and how it influenced his decision. As the series progressed, while the main focus hasn't changed, the target audience has slowly expanded. For Yakuza 0, we are looking to reset that. A statement complemented by a similar answer he gave during a Silicon Era interview. While that is something to be happy for, Yakuza is something made for male players, so we will be careful not to be too conscious of the female users and derail from what we want to make. Nagoshi has been very vocal about this in the past, insisting on the series' success being dependent on focusing on the male audience. Reiterating, time and again, Ryuga Gotoku is interesting in both its quirky and meaningful ways because it is a game for adult men. And as someone who loves this series, I am inclined to agree. Men are Yakuza's main demographic. Men are who Yakuza is designed to be played by, with lessons for men, by men. Ryuga Gotoku is for men. But Nagoshi-san, Yokoyama-san, if I may be so bold as to speak to you both directly, though, you may never hear me ask the question. What kind of man? Mr. Nagoshi, in the 10-year anniversary book, you have a section speaking on the last 10 years of the franchise, including its origins long before the series was so much as a single word in your mind. When the merger between Sega and Sammy had only recently been made official, you noted a vague unease. You wrote, and this is most likely roughly translated, 
Our future will be decided by what we make, by what we create. But when you think of it that way, we still haven't obtained anything. Is this the time to be happy? As an example of the sentiment you were feeling at the time. You continued to describe how you were feeling back then in 2004. In your belief, Sega had to change, and the ones who would need to take those first steps towards this change were you and your peers. You thought Sega needed to break away from the identity it had relied on before and bring to the table something fresh and different. Against all odds, Mr. Nagoshi, you took those first steps, butting heads with corporate executives who continuously turned down the project, arguing with your bosses about how you wanted to create, sneaking your work into meetings despite the danger to your career in order to succeed. Against constant adversity, you challenged the way of things and pushed against harsh backlash to your idea. Mr. Yokoyama, in the same book, you admit you had never studied script writing before Ryuga Gotoku. You didn't know the rules, and cite this as the reason you were able to write your stories for the series without falling into cliches. You throw yourself at the colossal undertaking of the entire production, with multiple departments citing your presence at various sessions and your willingness to volunteer yourself in order to achieve your vision. Celebrity actors leave the voiceover booth refreshed by your equalizing demeanor, treated without pomp and circumstance. You demand more from their performances in reportedly invigorating ways, and sir, the results speak for themselves. Stories of men being able to express themselves freely with one another and share in the camaraderie of each other's feelings. You've taught men their bonds are about more than competition and testosterone. You've shown men they can cry, can fail, can ask for help when they need it, and are stronger for doing so. You've created a protagonist who defends the weak, protects those under attack, and stands as a pillar of kindness and compassion one who imparts wisdom and freely admits when he is wrong. A man who defies odds, faces all kinds of dangers and tragedies, and still holds on to the warmth of a gentle heart, who believes all people, regardless of who they are, can grow and be better. What would typically emasculate a man in any other story, you understand as strength of character. Yet still, Ryuga Gotoku will spit in the face of Kazuma Kiryu, forgetting its own convictions. Mr. Nagoshi, it's clear to me as it is to anyone else who takes the time to listen to you speak that you are a very intelligent man. Your mannerisms, the small notes of empathy in your personal stories, a desire to convey emotion in your work, and an emphasis on passions over corporate mindsets. You are a creator who sought to capture human decency within the darkest underworlds, and accomplished this goal. But Mr. Nagoshi, it has been quite some time since Ryuga Gotoku's early inception. It's now a flagship series for Sega, setting an example for the rest of it. And you now find yourself in the same corporate seat you fought so passionately against to create something new. Now too, does Ryuga Gotoku need to change? And you can help it take those first steps. Mr. Yokoyama, if the games are made to cater to men, maybe it's time to ask what kind of man, character of man, quality of man it should cater to and inspire men to be, and Ryuga Gotoku has already made steps in the right direction. Games about men who protect those preyed on by society should endeavor to reflect the character of those men and aspire to emulate their values. Its convictions are meaningless if it pushes others down in order to sustain them. To quote your own writing, Mr. Yokoyama, don't let these words mean nothing. Strengthen them by being consistent with them. By being true to the values you've inspired men like me to have. Shouldn't the standards we hold ourselves to change to mirror our growth? Shouldn't we take the first steps towards being smarter, wiser men? I don't require Ryuga Gotoku to be a game which isn't designed for men. But as a man who believes in growing stronger, both in body and mind, I do want Ryuga Gotoku to be a game designed for better men. I want it to reflect my own growth as a man. I'm motivated by men like Kazuma Kiryu to embody positive ideals of masculinity and fight against men who seek to misuse those ideals for the sake of self-indulgence. I stand against the rushing stream of men who set a poor example for the rest of us, and I choose to be the dissenting voice pushing against their excuses and abuses of power. I do this in hopes of rising above them and becoming a better example, to become someone people are inspired by in the same way Kazuma Kiryu has done for me. I wish to be like a dragon, and I hope in the future, Ryuga Gotoku is able to say the same. <laughs> Hitotte no wa norikoeru koto de shika seichou dekinen da.